Okay, great. Um, so welcome everybody, I'm recording now. We have 67 people with us. We have a lot more people registered, so a lot more people are gonna watch this recording later. Uh, my name is Emily Bell Dinan. I am the Education Outreach Coordinator for the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. We are so honored to have uh, the Native Plant Trust and Uli Lormer, Director of Horticulture, join us today. And I'm just so excited about this topic about designing with native plants and what invasive species to avoid um, as gardening is literally my favorite subject of all things in the entire world. Um, and I think that's why this workshop is so popular because gardening is important to all of you. Um, and I like all the plant backgrounds that everybody has. So just before we get started, I'll go through our brief agenda. Well, it's not, it's a concise agenda with a lot of information in it. So we'll get through a little bit of my introduction where I'm gonna define some terms just make sure we're all on the same page of where we're going and what kind of bigger concepts we're talking about. Then I'm gonna hand it over to Uli, who's going to go through, um, it's, a, it's a very diverse topic, talking about native plants, the importance of biodiversity, the importance of native diversity, genetic diversity, conservation, and supporting diverse pollinator uh, life and the smaller creatures that support our lives that are all around us. I'm going to take it from there and go through um, kind of a boiled down list of invasives that are really popular um, and still often sold in horticulture and different plant nurseries, commercial nurseries, um, but species we'd like you to avoid or if they're already in your garden in the Adirondacks or the Capital District or Massachusetts or Rochester, wherever you're zooming in from, um, to kindly dig it up and compost it. Um, so I'll go through a little list and um, I'll be giving you tip sheets after as follow-up that have more, uh, a much more detailed list of different invasives to avoid. We're gonna go into the concept of jumping worms, invasive jumping worms, which are a growing ecological problem in our region um, and several states surrounding ours. And we also have recordings of more detailed workshops we held last year that I'm gonna link you to about jumping worms in some of my follow-up resources as well. Um, and then speaking of resources, I'm just gonna review the resources I'm gonna send you because I'm gonna send you kind of a, a dense packet of information for you to explore. And then we'll jump into our Q&A. So um, thank you so much for in the registration of being able to answer or fill out that, you know, what kind of concepts are you really looking for for this workshop? So a lot of people are zooming in today from different parts of the state. Uh, which we're really used to because I'd say probably 75% of the Adirondack population is seasonal. So people, you know, before the 4th of July are in Massachusetts or New Jersey or Dutchess County and then come on up here. So uh, we're going to talk specifically about, you know, this, what the Native Plant Trust and you know, others call the Northeastern Highlands ecoregion and different plants specific to our ecoregion here in the Adirondacks. But as you can see from this map, that might actually apply to the high peaks of the Catskills. It might apply to the Green Mountains. It might even apply to Nova Scotia. So just to be on the same terms, we're gonna talk about a lot of plants and pollinators that affect us here in the North Country. Um, but a lot of these plants might also be commercially available uh, closer to home. Um, if you're in the Berkshires, if you're in Dutchess County, or maybe even Long Island. So just to be on the same terms, and then a little bit about us or the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program, or APIP, as we're commonly called. We are one of eight partners for regional invasive species management or PRISMs across New York State. Um, APIP it serves the North Country, so all of Adirondack Park, then going north up to the Canadian border and east into the lovely Champlain Valley. But I can also connect you to different prisms in your part of the state if you're not zooming in from the APIP prism region. If you're in the Capital District or Long Island, um, there's one of me in your area to serve you. Um, so we are housed and managed within the Nature Conservancy and then co-managed by the Department of Environmental Conservation and funded through um, the, just got refunded again by the legislature, um, 
I'll have to remember it, I'm sorry. We're partially funded by the Department of Environmental Conservation or funds managed by the Department of Environmental Conservation. So our goals are to prevent new infestations of invasive species, early detect and rapidly respond to invasive species and mitigate impacts of priority species. And we do that through in terrestrial spaces and aquatic spaces. And a lot of our prevention and awareness building work comes through education outreach programs, which I run for the Adirondack Park Invasive Plant Program. I feel like in the chat is my colleague Zach saying exactly, yes, the Environmental Protection Fund. Thank you, Zach. Um, and that fund is managed by the Department of Environmental Conservation. So I don't really need to talk very much about myself. Um, I've been in this position for a year and it's really great to see a lot of you return to our workshops and I'm happy to be building these workshops up for you all to serve different needs. Um, before I came to this position, I managed a soil water conservation district out in rural Oregon. And before that, I have been in many different positions working in horticulture and community greening projects, um, trying to help people adapt to or adopt sustainability solutions in their gardening. So I met Uli Lormer at a wonderful organization called the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. And Uli is um, a well-respected, uh, much beloved leader in native plant education, native plant horticulture, native plant conservation, um, and advocacy for, for different groups working to promote the use of native species. Um, Uli, how many years were you at the Brooklyn Botanic Garden managing the native plant garden? Uh, 14. 14 years. Um, and he was um, a major figurehead in helping to conserve native species and seeds from the tri-state area to uh, actually grow out all of BBG's or Brooklyn Botanic Garden's new spaces in the native plant garden and then went on to become the director of horticulture at the Native Plant Trust in Framingham, Massachusetts two, two years ago, but three seasons ago. So we're so honored to have him here today. Um, and I have his email and my email up here on the screen. And so jumping into again, and I do apologize if I'm going quickly, I'm trying to conserve time. Um, kind of getting on the same baseline of what we we're, we're talking about with invasive species. So I just wanna go into some definitions because that was a question a lot of folks had. Um, so what do we mean by invasive species? Is it your common dandelions that you see every day? Is it um, a horticultural dahlia that may or may not be able to survive the winter? Um, there's a lot of different ranges when it comes to non-native plants. And it's a lot of gray areas, a lot of um, questions to be asked. But what we really want to focus on are if these species that we're talking about have observed harm, either cause an ecological harm, so they might destabilize a food web, it might be economic harm if a species, and it doesn't have to be a plant, it might be an animal, um, decimates a waterway or even um, can physically destroy infrastructure, built infrastructure, say for drinking water or even for roads, or then even causes social harm. So um, my last workshop was about fishing and angling, which is of great cultural importance as is gardening and horticulture and agriculture. And so if a species comes in or is introduced and destabilizes a food web or outcompetes a native species, and then we lose that species of interest, are we also losing a cultural value? So are we losing a fish that's really, really important? Are we losing um, different types of butterflies that are socially important? Are we losing types of trees that are used for different crafts and different um, social and economic values? Um, excuse me. So when we talk about an invasive species, so I have yellow flag iris in the middle here. It's also called a noxious species. Um, this is one of APIP's um, priority invasive species that causes observed ecological, economic, and social harm. Um, they can clog waterways, they rapidly reproduce um, asexually and sexually. Um, they can uh, absorb huge amounts of fresh water out of wetlands and so uh, hydrology is shifted and that ecosystem is no longer acting the way it should, save for native aquatic plants or 
larger animals that feed on smaller animals. So we have an osprey feeding on a fish. We also have non-native species that might be introduced. So we have California poppies, not true poppies, won't get into it. Um, and so these species might even be native to North America, but it's not necessarily going to rapidly get out of control or even grow too successfully in a new geography. And so we're not too worried about it. And then you have your nuisance species. So is a dandelion, though not native, really that problematic? It might be annoying, it might be in your way, but are we seeing it cause this ecological, economic, or social harm? Um, we're going to get into a number of species where what we call biogeography really plays a role. So it might even, with the California poppy, it might be a native to North America species, but it's not necessarily native to our ecoregion. And so we're observing something kind of grow out of control and displace other native species. And this context is always changing. So something, you know, 10 years ago that we were promoting, we're now observing is having some sort of ecological problem. A lot of the plants we're gonna talk about or that I'll talk about later this after, or this morning were once prized horticultural plants. So they were introduced in the 1700s, 1800s, 1900s. And we thought, wow, this is so useful. This is so beautiful. Um, over time, we've observed that that is not exactly the case, and that's a social construction we've projected on that species. And so why are some species invasive? A lot of the plants I'm gonna talk about, so Japanese barberry is a good example, um, lack predators and parasites. So they're not um, chosen by grazers to snack on. So they might have a physical composition like barbs, that prevent deer from eating it. It also just might taste really bad. It might even be toxic to different plants. So swallowworts um, look really similar to our uh, native milkweed, but they're actually can be, they can actually be toxic to different butterflies that are attracted to it. Um, producing a vast amount of seeds and offspring. So purple loosestrife also introduced as a horticultural plant, also brought in ship ballast, it's complicated. Um, produce exponential amounts of seed. Um, and then scotch broom is another great example of a plant that was brought here for horticultural and agricultural purposes to stabilize soils and actually fix nitrogen out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil. Um, but they produce massive amounts of seed that also spring off of, its, off of the parent plant into the environment to dominate an ecosystem and create a monoculture. And then I mentioned yellow flag iris. This is also a plant that can reproduce by multiple means. So it can produce by seed, but it also spreads laterally through really fast growing rhizomes. Um, and a lot of the plants I'm gonna talk about at the end of species to avoid are generalists. So they can handle a lot of different light conditions. They can handle a lot of different soil conditions. Um, in Uli's talk, he's going to mention a lot of native plants that have really, really narrow growing specifications. So they can handle temperatures, you know, two weeks out of the year. They can handle really specific uh, nitrogen loads in the soil. They can handle very specific light conditions, which only come up, say, when large trees in the canopy haven't yet leafed out. Um, and so we see a lot of these species monopolize resources and, uh, as I mentioned, shift plant compositions or in a community or also shift food webs. Um, so I'm gonna, now that I've defined some of those terms, I'm going to pass it along to Uli. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. I'm gonna let Uli take it away. So please put your questions in the chat and I'm gonna go on mute. Okay, good morning, everybody. Everybody hopefully can see my screen. Um, so thank you, uh, Emily, for the opportunity to join your workshop. And um, thank you to everybody who's tuned in this morning um, and who will be listening to this later on via recording. Uh, so the, the real main thrust of what I would like to, to impart today is sort of twofold. Um, one is, um, I really want to encourage people to spend as much time outdoors as possible in natural spaces, um, because I think that there's a tremendous amount of information and inspiration you can gain from 
hiking in the woods and through old fields and forests and so forth. And, uh, and this information can actually be really useful for you as a gardener, as a horticulturalist uh, when using native plants. So um, the approach that I've adopted um, you know, nearly 20 years ago when I first started working with natives was to try to learn about each species by seeing it in context. So where does it grow in the wild? With whom does it grow? Uh, so that there, you get this kind of plant community uh, reinforcement and structure. Um, what kind of conditions does it seem to prefer? Um, and all of that is really useful information for, um, for you as a, as a horticulturist and a, and a gardener. So, um, and then the second big thing that I wanna talk about is specifically about pollinators and native plants. And, um, and it's, it's um, I put this talk together specifically to challenge people a little bit with the assumption of uh, um, something being pollinator friendly. Now, I think pollinator friendly is a really good term. Uh, and I think we should all try to make our gardens as pollinator friendly as possible. However, um, if I observe uh, a honeybee on my, on my plant, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's supporting as much life as it could. Um, and so I'll delve into this a little bit more deeply uh, when I get to that um, sort of more than pollinator friendly um, section. And then I included a little bit in the end uh, about, uh, I think, a real challenge for a lot of people interested in using native plants, and that is um, where to get them and why are they sometimes really hard to find. Um, and uh, you're not alone in, in this struggle, and it's something that, um, you know, native plant horticulture as an as a industry uh, recognizes, uh, and there's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that come into play, which we'll, which we'll also address a little bit. But um, I wanted to start by, by just, again, some, some bigger picture ideas about how much biodiversity there is actually in our region. Um, so um, one of my sort of uh, um, go-to reference books um, is a manual of flora of the Northeast United States that um, was completed in 1991 and listed uh, 4,200 and some species of plants. It's been updated recently um, by some colleagues of mine at the New York Botanic Gardens, and that number has now ticked up to uh, approximately 5,300 species in the Northeast, which is a lot. However, um, about 30% of those 5,300 species are actually non-natives. And so it's not that we're discovering new native species, it's that non-natives continue to be added to our flora and they fall in, uh, along that gradient that Emily explained so nicely between non-natives that show up, maybe they're garden escapees, uh, to nuisance plants like uh, uh, dandelions and all the way to uh, plants that are known invasives or ones that um, you know, botanists and taxonomists and so forth are closely watching because they're showing the signs of, be, uh, they have a potential to become invasive. Um, and again, this is where this relationship with the horticultural industry as a whole uh, 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 is actually really important because um, this industry is, is largely responsible for introducing many of these plants into gardens um, and then they escape out of the gardens. Anyway, so um, I like some maps. So here's a map of the concentration of native species um, and so areas that you see that are really in the dark blue are areas of high species diversity. Um, and so uh, there are a lot of endemic plants in these regions, ones that are only found in those regions. So for example, California or the Florida Panhandle. Um, but you'll see that in the Northeast and particularly in the Mid-Atlantic, uh, we also have a great number of species here, um, which is a good thing. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of native species um, in the Northeast as general. Now, if we look at this in terms of exotic species or non-natives, you can also see that the Northeast is a leader uh, in the number of non-native species that are here. And one of the other ways I think that you can correlate this, uh, think about ports of entry um, and ships. And Emily, uh, again, set the stage really nicely by talking about purple loosestrife uh, arriving in ship ballast. Um, and so anywhere where you have major seaports, you know, historically were uh, roads and entry points for non-native plants. And so it stands to reason that the Northeast especially 
is particularly rich with non-native species. Um, you know, some of them have not uh, um, spread into the Adirondacks quite yet, um, but you know, that's kind of the whole point of, of Emily's program um, is to try to be you know, the, the first, uh, um, um, the vanguard against this invasion and to help prevent those. So um, then I also wanna talk about, you know, what is like, you know, how, how do you define a native and how far away from where do you live would be considered native enough? And I wanted to use this viburnum, a beautiful uh, hobble bush as a great example. If you look at the USDA plants database, which is a wonderful database for ranges of natives, um, at this scale, you would say, okay, this uh, I would be perfectly in the right if I lived in Georgia and planting this plant because Georgia is green. It exists in all of these states. Now, if you zoom in a little bit further, which is a nice thing about USDA has county level data, you can see that it exists in one county in Georgia. All right, uh, and many of you who know this plant also know that it is a plant that is mostly restricted to mountain regions and cooler climates. And so it kind of travels along the Appalachians and the Blue Ridge into the Poconos and then starts to spread up into, uh, you know, Catskills, Adirondacks, Green Mountains, White Mountains up into Maine where the, where the, uh, the weather is cool. So, um, as the climate warms, um, this plant is going to get squeezed off the top of mountains in the south and will continue to move further north if it can. Um, and so the point I'm making is that ranges are not static. Plants migrate, they move in response to the environment. Um, the way that we like to define native uh, um, has to do not with political boundaries because plants don't care if they're New Yorkers or from Vermont or Massachusetts. They respond to um, biological factors. And so the concept of an ecoregion is, uh, is something that takes into account soils, geology, hydrology, climate, slope, aspect, and it kind of puts them into these larger groupings um, and so you can see, as, as Emily pointed out, that the Northeastern Highland region, which includes high peaks of the Catskills, uh, a lot of the mountains in Northern, uh, uh, in New Jersey, uh, Berkshires, Adirondacks, all the way, um, they all share similar floristic characters. So you have similar groups of plants, just in the same way that there are groups of plants that really only grow down here on the coastal plain. Um, and so, the flora of Cape Cod and Long Island and the Pine Barrens in New Jersey all have similarities because of the environmental conditions and the kinds of plants that have adapted to grow there. So at Native Plant Trust, we've kind of simplified that map a little bit more. Um, and so when we talk about um, choosing plants that are appropriate for where you live, um, we really want you to try to source your plants from within the same ecoregion. So if you live here in Eastern Massachusetts, you wanna have plants that were collected in the wild from anywhere within that coastal zone. If you live here in the Adirondacks, if you garden in the Adirondacks, you wanna to try to source your plants from anywhere within that Northeastern Highland zone, because that means that these plants are gonna be well adapted to the conditions of life in the Adirondacks. Um, and it's a, it's a, it's a little bit of a harder concept to, to wrap around because people understand state boundaries and say, well, this is a New York native. Like, you know, there's nothing wrong with a little bit of, uh, of, of state pride, uh, but again, um, your plants don't care. Um, that's entirely a human construct. Last example I wanna use here is um, just as, a, as a, a, another sort of case study in shifting ranges is seaside goldenrod. This is a, a wonderful goldenrod that's adapted to life uh, right up against the ocean. It's very salt tolerant, but people are now seeing it spreading inland along roads because of the use of salt in the winters. So we put a lot of salt on the roads to make sure they don't get icy. That salt washes into the soil and makes the soil saltier and makes it the perfect kind of habitat for a plant that normally wants to be close to the ocean to start showing up much, much further inland. 
And so its range is shifting again as a response to human activities. Um, quick thing here, but I'm, I'm gonna go pretty quickly about this. This, is, this was a project that I was involved in at BBG. Um, and it was a 20 year study of the changes in flora of a major metropolitan area. And um, preliminary results, as you would expect in a very urbanized context is that many native species are declining in their ranges and many non-natives are becoming more abundant. The maps read in that orange squares represent um, known locations for these plants pre-1990 and green squares post-1990. So an example here would be Tree of Heaven, right? So Tree of Heaven before 1990, only in a couple of these little orange squares, post-1990 um, is pretty much spread out through the entire region, at least in the tri-state area here. Um, Many of the plants that we're seeing this in terms of expanding, expanding plants are common ones that are available in the nursery trade and things that um, you might be, some, some are on uh, known invasive lists and others are not yet, but some surprises, for example, might be hardy kiwi vine, uh, um, Korean dogwood, kusa dogwoods, uh, chervil, if anybody's ever seen uh, chervil, it's a, it's a carrot family member that's all over any roadside in the Catskills, and I'm sure uh, making its way into the Adirondacks. Uh, and then also calorie pear, Radford pears, popular street tree that people planted all over the place, not thinking it would go anywhere. Um, here is the map for calorie pear. Pre-1990, um, it wasn't seen escaping anywhere. And now as of 2010, this is how far it is. I'm sure if we added another 10 years of data, it would be uh, even further spread. So, um, you know, invasions are happening um, and all the more reason for folks to get out into the wild to see what's happening um, because the earlier you can get these things, the better. Um, last example uh, is another sort of sad one. Um, bunchberry, a really wonderful uh, uh, um, low growing ground cover um, that, uh, likes northern climates, again, is rapidly disappearing from the tri-state area because uh, it's running out of um, mountain and hilltop. It's getting squeezed off the top. And the only place it's still left is here at the highest point, New Jersey, and um, probably not there for much longer. So um, I'd like to switch gears a little bit um, now that we've sort of established that, you know, there's a lot of diversity out there. Uh, it's constantly changing and shifting. Um, and how does that impact the relationships that these plants have with all the other forms of life that we like to see in our gardens and the forms of life that are really crucial to a functioning ecosystem? And I'm targeting pollinators here specifically um, because um, people like to see butterflies and bees and other things in their gardens. Um, and I think it really behooves us to have a good understanding of their, the interactions and relationships between this group of insects and the plants that they rely on. So um, they have co-evolved with one another. And so plants have uh, uh, really targeted certain animals for their reproductive success. Uh, and similarly, as animals have targeted certain plants for reproductive success. And that, you know, you can't really distill this any more clearly, but Pollinators are keystone species for ecosystem health and resilience. This is just, it does not get any more concrete and simple and clear as this, that without insects, um, plants would not be able to survive, everything would collapse. And so uh, a big part of our message at Native Plant Trust is that we want to uh, um, promote ecological gardening where the choices that you make in your garden are really intended to support the greatest breadth of life as possible. Um, so it's not just about gardens being pretty for us as humans, they can be beautiful for us and they can also be ecologically functioning. Um, so, uh, and, and my, my look at this, even though I, you know, plants are most certainly my wheelhouse, um, I've put this talk together from the perspective of the insects. And so this is a little bit different than what most people think of like, here's a plant and here's the insects that they support. I'd say, here's the insect and these are the plants that support it. And so viewed through this lens, conserving pollinators actually maintains a great deal of species diversity because of these many interconnected relationships. 
And so the more interactions between plant and pollinators there are, that increases the amount of seed, the amount of plants, and the amount of plant-based food, shelter, nesting, and so forth for um, mammals, little things like our chipmunk here, uh, and all the way up to our top predators, um, like our, our red-tailed hawk here, who is uh, disemboweling a squirrel at the moment. But the squirrel needed food and shelter uh, to, to eat, and it got it from an oak tree. And how did the oak tree get there? Well, the oak tree got there because of the interactions of, uh, of insects and plants and so forth uh, in past generations. And so all of this stuff is connected. And so really promoting the greatest amount of pollinators uh, is going to also afford you a great degree of species diversity in plants and is gonna draw in all of that other kind of life uh, that we love to see in our gardens. So again, really, really simply distilled here for plants, the whole purpose of pollination is to make seed, right? And they've come up with lots of tricky ways to ensure that it happens, but making seed ensures that they can pass on adaptations, so genetic diversity and genetic adaptations, which means a better chance and a greater chance for the survival of that species into the future. And for insects, it is the pollen and the nectar that the flowers provide that give it food for its young. And that is, a, again, a chance to pass on adaptations a chance for reproductive success and a chance for survival of that pollinator into the future. And so they, they, they sort of both feed into one another in this really you know, elegant loop, uh, even though they both have, uh, plants have their own desires, uh, if you can say, and insects in the same, same way, but they're so very much connected with one another. So quick, quick examples, our beautiful shooting star here, um, is what's called buzz pollinated. It has anthers that look like uh, a sponge. And so uh, a bee and particularly a bumblebee that is large enough and muscular enough must vibrate its wings at the right frequency to literally shake the pollen out of the anthers. So it's not sort of like dusty. It doesn't get uh, uh, um, you know, picked up just by the insect crawling around. It has to be um, the right frequency of vibration or buzz. Smaller bees, sorry, can't do anything with this guy. Larger bees, maybe also not right, but the right size bee, it's perfect. Um, this is the way in which uh, many of our important agricultural crops are pollinated. Um, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants, cranberries, all use this pollination mechanism and they all need native bees uh, not just honeybees to perform this. Um, mountain laurel has spring-loaded anthers. You see how they're kind of tucked into the corners here so that when a bee comes to forage, it trips the spring and the anther literally just uh, uh, springs and dusts the back of the insect with pollen. And then I took a picture here of this uh, wonderful beard tongue just to show you that as the insect is lured into the back for, uh, for its nectar reward, the way that the uh, anthers are sort of beautifully curled around so that it gets dusted. And then right here in the center is the female par uh, part uh, and it's perfectly positioned to pick up the, the, the pollen when the insect visits another flower. So there, there's no mistake about the design of these things. They're all purposeful um, to achieve these goals of making seed and ensuring future generations. Um, Pink lady slippers, on the other hand, use subterfuge and deceit. They don't offer any reward to an insect. There's no nectar, there's no pollen. And when insects enter into the slipper, they have to crawl out right back here in order to exit. And in doing so, we'll pick up pollen and transfer pollen. Skunk cabbage makes the inside of its flowers hot. It can be up to 15 to 20 degrees warmer inside of that flower than outside. And so it ends up being a really great place for flies and bees to overnight, as it were, until the next day. And in doing so, they crawl around and pick up pollen and transfer it around. So lots of really wonderful, I mean, I could go on and on about these wonderful little uh, uh, stories about how each plant is designed to achieve its goals. But again, uh, every plant has a different, different aim to it. Um, senna, another wonderful plant, produces extra floral nectaries. 
So these are structures that just make nectar for the purposes of attracting ants, which will then defend the flower from anything that wants to eat it. Uh, and so the plant not only attracts uh, pollinators with its showy blossoms, but it also recruits insects as its own defense mechanism. Absolutely wonderful. So um, most people, when you think about pollinators, think about um, bees and butterflies and pretty things that fly. I'm here to give you a little shout out that beetles are also incredibly important as pollinators, even though maybe they're not as, as beautiful. Um, and their relationship with, with plants is particularly old and ancient. And I'm showing you these plants because these are ones that um, in the, on the evolutionary scale uh, of flowering plants are some of the first ones to have evolved. So things like pawpaw, uh, uh, water lilies, uh, magnolias, tulip poplars um, are all really, really old plants. And particularly the pawpaw here, um, the color of that flower is meant to attract things that like um, dead things in the woods, all right? So it doesn't smell sweet, just like stinking benjamin and wild ginger. Um, you can almost say that their flowers are flesh colored. And so the pollinators that it wants to attract are gonna be things like fungus gnats and beetles and flies that would normally be attracted to um, some piece of carrion or dead uh, animal in the woods. And a lot of the, the lures, the, the, the fragrance that these plants emit um, are very similar to those that would come off of something dead. If you ever, if you don't believe me, next time you see a beautiful trillium erectum, stick your nose in there. And this sometimes also gets called the wet dog trillium. Um, it's, it's not a nice fragrance, um, but again, it, it achieves its purpose. Um, and I'm really only saying this here is that, that not everything for pollinators has to be pretty and sweet smelling. All right, so um, again, beetles are a really wonderful group. Um, you know, Rose of Carolina here, absolutely crawling with uh, um, um, longhorn flower beetles. Um, spirea is another great plant to attract beetles. Um, and your goldenrod soldier beetle, even though it's a goldenrod, uh, soldier beetle, it likes pretty much anything that's in the composite family. So it's a great uh, uh, pollinator of your black-eyed Susan, your asters, your goldenrods, anything within that family. So I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because we're all very much aware of the challenges to pollination systems. Um, and um, I'm going to try to focus a little bit here more about um, competition. Uh, from um, common bumblebees and uh, honeybees, um, but you know we're well. We'll keep going. So the honeybee dilemma. Everybody likes honeybees uh, because they make honey. Um, honey's uh, honeybee is one of nearly 450 species of bees in the Northeast. All right, and it's from Europe. Um, and I think the big reason why people like honeybees is because humans get something out of the relationship, which is honey. And so uh, being very self-serving, you want to keep honeybees around because, you know, why not? We want to have honey. However, um, they are social insects. Of the 450 species of bees, only about 5% of our natives are social insects, which means the overwhelming majority of those are solitary nesting and solitary uh, um, uh, bees. And so they are not going to be able to compete with a large colony. Uh, honeybees are very territorial. They are generalist feeders. They don't care what the flower looks like, the shape of the flower or the color, and they're greedy. They will come and, uh, uh, and, and uh, feed in one area until all of the resources are depleted before moving on to another. Um, they're oftentimes active for longer periods of time, whereas some of our native bees are only seasonally active. So some in the spring, only some in the summer. Um, and it is possible to have honeybees and native bees in healthy populations, but you have to have sufficient forage available. So this means really having enough geographical area in order for uh, uh, everybody to, to uh, get along nicely. Um, I'm gonna skip past this and just give you one more example of how things are connected. Um, 
So our beautiful white fringed orchid is a, is a, uh, a denizen of, of bogs uh, um, and wetlands. It has these really wonderful long nectar spurs and that the only insect that can pollinate it is a hawk moth. I think we lost Uli for a second. Oh, here he's back. Do you want to reshare Uli? I think you're off mute or you're on mute. We lost you for a minute. Okay, everybody hear me again? All right, good. So yeah, so the, the orchid can only be pollinated by hawk moth and the favorite food of the hawk moth is, uh, or the hawk moth is the favorite food of the whippoorwill. Um, and so as hawk moths uh, decline, if there's not enough space and availability and habitat for the hawk moth. That means there's less white fringed orchids around. It also means you'll have less whippoorwills around. And so, in some ways, the whippoorwill is entirely uh, tied to the health of fringed orchid populations. Um, and so, again, it's just another example of how these things are all really, really well connected. So, uh, to get to, to the real, the main gist of what I want to talk about here, um, and I, is is um, supporting not only generalist poll uh, pollinators but specialists. All right. And a really wonderful analogy to talk about this are dietary restrictions, okay? Um, most of us will understand dietary restrictions if you have a gluten allergy or shellfish or eggs, peanuts, so forth. Um, you understand that you have to be very careful about what you take into your body in order for you to survive. And so for specialists, uh, it's the same way, all right? Pollen specialists, uh, specialist uh, uh, um, pollinators, have to um, feed from specific plants in order for them to be able to survive and to be able to reproduce. Um, and so species diversity is really important here. Um, and they, without their preferred species on the landscape, they certainly won't, they'll just disappear. And so what I'm saying is that by, by supporting specialists, it's, you're not just supporting only them. The, these plants that I'm going to show you here uh, coming up um, also support all of the generalist uh, pollinators, but they also support the specialists as well. And you'll notice that a lot of these are also species. And so I'm gonna go through a couple of groups in, uh, uh, and um, families of plants um, that have been identified to be really great for pollen specialists. So in the carrot family, you have your, your two golden alexanders. These are really wonderful wetland plants with Zizia aptera and Zizia aria. Um, in the composite family, there are loads and loads of examples. So you have everything from boltonias um, to flea banes to asters, uh, coreopsis, rudbeckias, your black eyed Susans, um, goldenrods. We have lots and lots of species of goldenrods. Um, there are lots of goldenrods that are great for small gardens. There are goldenrods that are great for large spaces. Um, all the Joe Pye weeds are really wonderful plants. So uh, hollow stem Joe, Joe Pye weed, purple Joe Pye weed, uh, any of your beggars ticks, Bidens uh, are, are really fantastic plants. Sunflowers, uh, blazing stars, liatris, um, thistles, believe it or not, uh, we do have native thistles and they are absolutely fantastic for pollinators. Every time I've ever seen a thistle in the wild, it's covered in at least six or seven bumblebees all the time. Um, iron weeds, um, sneeze weeds, heleniums, uh, purple sneeze weeds. Again, all of these fit into the same category. Uh, and by planting these, New England aster, swamp aster, heart leaf aster, smooth aster, bushy aster, all of these asters not only support all of the generalist species, but you're also providing the crucial 
dietary needs for all of these pollen specialists as well. Um, bone sets, uh, groundsels here with golden groundsel and running groundsel. Um, these are particularly great choices because they're spring blooming uh, as opposed to most of the asters and golden rods are gonna be summer and fall blooming. Um, they're really wonderful choices. In the bellflower family, you've got harebells, uh, tall bellflower, and even a little annual here called uh, the Venus looking glass um, are great for pollen specialists. Heath family, um, also big favorites in gardens. Um, you have bear bear, you've got mountain laurel, sheep laurel, bog laurel, uh, all of your rhododendrons, rhodoras, rose bays, pinkster blooms, um, swamp azaleas, leather leaf, um, huckleberries, wintergreen, all of the blueberries, uh, um, trailing arbutus, cranberry. Um, these are all wonderful plants for pollen specialists. In the mints, um, we're looking specifically at Menardas. So uh, Oswego tea, wild bergamot, and spotted horsemint down here with the, with the great digger wasp uh, getting in there um, are wonderful choices. Um, all of the loose stripes, and here we're talking about our native loose stripes, um, fringe loose strife, world loose strife. Um, this one here is a really great plant for wetlands in the Adirondacks and swamp candles as well. This group supports specifically oil and resin bees because these plants, the flowers make a particular resin that they need to reproduce. Um, from the rose family, uh, some more diminutive choices, uh, white avens, wild strawberry, a shrubby cinquefoil, and um, our sebaldiopsis are wonderful choices. Um, saxifrage family, we've got um, foam flower, mitella or bishop wart. In the scrofularia, the figwort family, all of your uh, um, beard tongues and penstemons um, are really wonderful for pollen specialists. Verbenas, good wetland plants. And then a big shout out for violets. I really love violets. They're really wonderful plants. They're diverse. They grow in a lot of different kinds of habitats from wet to dry. Um, they're not too aggressive. If you ever think they're too aggressive, then you just weed some of them out. And they fill in really nicely in gardens all around other little spaces. Um, so there's a number of different violets here uh, in different colors that are uh, wonderful choices to add into gardens. For nectar, um, we want to support pollinators that have short, shorter tongues, and this is where your milkweeds come in, and they're really wonderful. Um, so world milkweed, common milkweed, butterfly milkweed, bush honeysuckle, spreading dogbane, button bush. Um, for uh, insects that have a longer tongue, you see that these flowers are also more tubular shaped. Um, so lobelias, turtle heads, monkey flowers, um, hyssop, baptisia. Uh, the obedient plant, our wonderful blue flag iris, uh, even jewelweed, which is uh, great for long tongued insects and also an absolute hummingbird magnet. Uh, many of you might think of it as an annual weed, but it's ecologically very, very important. And then finally, a couple plants for pollen. Um, and these are your St. John's warts. All right, three choices here. And then willows. Willows actually are an interesting group because not only are they wind pollinated, but they also produce a lot of pollen early in the season for those specialist uh, pollinators. Uh, and we have a lot of a lot of different willows that are native to uh, the wetlands of our of, of our uh, region. Um, so you can't go wrong planting a willow. Um, I'll also say that willows rank very highly, just in the same way that oaks do, uh, in supporting um, butterfly and moth caterpillars. Um, so uh, definitely a great choice uh, for your gardens. Spireas flowering raspberry, roses are also really great. So uh, some takeaways 
uh, obviously, um, I think I've made a pretty good case to support species diversity. Um, and so I think that's something that, that people can really do. Um, if you want to plant a goldenrod or an aster, don't just plant one, plant three different species, and you'll be able to support more life that way. Um, a lot of research has, has kind of zeroed in on this idea of about 70% native, meaning that your yard uh, and your garden, you should aim for it to be about 70% native to support the maximum amount of life. And that 30% allows you lots of space to, to keep your, your, uh, your lilacs, you keep your plants that, are, that may have sentimental value uh, uh, and, and, and other uh, well-behaved non-natives. Um, so that you don't have to be a purist in order to really support a lot of natives, but try to aim for that about 70%, two thirds to three quarters. Uh, um, and you'll be doing a really wonderful service for the ecosystems in a larger sense. Um, again, thinking about how to extend floral resources throughout the season. So you want things that really bloom very early all the way through to things that are in bloom late before the, you know, and even in some cases after frost arrives. Um, think three dimensionally so that there's shelter and nesting opportunities. And then leaving bare earth is actually also important because many of our uh, native bees are ground nesters and they're not gonna nest if you mulch everything to death, all right? So leaving a little bit of ground, uh, a bare earth or sandy earth around is great because it allows them to dig their nests and, and complete their life cycle. Um, and then leaving it messy. This is another thing that, that uh, a lot of the studies have shown that um, that yards that aren't super tidy and clean actually support far more life uh, because things overwinter in leaf litter, things overwinter in stems that were left up and not cut down immediately in the fall. Um, so I would make a plea to avoid trying to get ahead of your spring cleanup by doing it in the fall. Like wait until spring comes, wait until you start to see some of these insects in the air and flying and you'll know it's okay to start cleaning up the stems and leaves from the year before. Um, if you're too stuck on it being super tidy uh, and raking up all those leaves, there's a good chance that you will have raked up uh, queen bumblebees, uh, caterpillar larvae, any, any number of things that need that leaf litter to survive the winter. Um, lastly, um, poor soils are a gift. Not every native wants to grow in the same soils that your vegetables grow in, right? So you don't need to bring in compost. You don't need to amend the soil. In fact, many of the most interesting plants grow on very poor soils. And if you happen to have that condition in your garden, find plants that are suited to that rather than trying to change the soil conditions to grow things that, uh, uh, that you want. Um, there's so much diversity out there. I guarantee you that there is uh, a plant that will fit your conditions. Then when you go to uh, shop, always ask questions. You wanna know about where your plants were sourced, were they grown using pesticides, um, you know, uh, and is a species available over a cultivar? Um, okay, so a little bit more about the nursery industry and then I'll wrap it up here. Um, so you want to you want to plant more natives. This is fantastic. Okay, and so you go to the local garden center or you go to the big box store, and you discover that they maybe they have a natives corner, which is like you know a little off off the side back section that has maybe ten plants in it. Um, you're not alone in this. Um, the Mount Cuba Center, which is a wonderful native plant garden in the Mid Atlantic, did a survey of wholesale nurseries. And so again, wholesale nurseries are the ones that are feeding the landscape industry and all the designers and everybody else. And their results showed that 75% of what wholesale nursery carries are non-natives, all right? So that only 25% of those were natives. And then of that 25%, again, only a quarter of those are actually straight species, meaning that the, the large majority of what you have available commercially are cultivars of hybrids. And cultivars are ones that are often produced um, through cloning or through cuttings. So they don't have the genetic diversity. Um, there's still a lot of 
research out there to see whether or not cultivars are as good as species from an ecological standpoint. But most of the results uh, show that insects and pollinators prefer the species um, over the cultivars. Last thing I'll say is that cultivars are also bred entirely for aesthetic reasons. We want bigger flowers, double flowered things, things with you know, variegated foliage or a shorter stature. We're not breeding plants to produce more nectar or more, or more pollen or uh, to, to, to really support more life. That's the, the industry is not doing that. It's entirely because it's, it, we think of plants as ornaments, not as ecologically functioning members of a larger ecosystem. Um, you just think of it as something pretty because you wanna see color and texture. And you can have all of those things and support the life. Um, it doesn't necessarily just have to be pretty. So, you know, most of the nurseries that specialize in natives are tend to be smaller, sort of niche. Um, native plant sales only account for about 13% of total nursery sales in the United States. So we have a lot of work to do to get uh, more natives out into the landscape. Um, and because it's a niche industry, they end up being a little bit more expensive. Um, you can think of it as, um, you know, you will pay more money for organic produce that was grown from the farm down the road, just in the same way that people will likely pay more money for a native plant that was sourced down the road and grown locally and organically. Um, and so that, that just kind of limits the availability. It limits, uh, particularly if you are, are economically challenged, uh, um, uh, you can't, it's just harder to find these kinds of plants to get them out. There's a general lack of knowledge about native plants. Um, and most of the, of the studies of consumer preference show that people um, don't care where their plants come from. People don't care uh, if they're potentially invasive. Um, and they're really only looking for bigger flowers, prettier flowers, and cheaper prices. And that really feeds into this much more industrial scale of production that produces a lot of non-natives because we know how to grow them by the hundreds of thousands at a time. So a lot of challenges here. And again, you shouldn't feel bad that you wanna use native plants and they're hard to find. Um, this is a situation that nearly everybody across the United States faces uh, when wanting to use more natives. There just simply isn't the supply to meet the demand. And that's, that's, that's unfortunate. The only way that I see this changing is if individual consumers begin to, uh, uh, to demand more natives and say, okay, hey, I, I want to support my local garden center, but if you can't tell me whether or not these plants were grown with pesticides and you can't offer more natives, then I will take my dollar somewhere else. You know, um, the big box stores, you know, they're, they're, they're beginning to show uh, uh, and they're beginning to do this, but we need more people to demand it. And that's the only way that the nursery industry will respond is to more consumer demand. Um, the last thing I would say again is um, tell all your friends about it, share your knowledge, share your passion, um, share seed from your garden, uh, even better share plants with one another. Uh, a lot of natives are wonderful and easy to divide and spread around. Um, there's nothing better than the gift of, of, of a, a lovingly divided plant that both you and your friend can enjoy for, for many, many seasons to come. Mary Ellen. So um, with that, I will say thank you. There's some resources here. Um, and some good books about pollinators of native plants. Um, really anything written by Heather Holm right now is absolutely fantastic. She has books on pollinators, on bees. She just put out a brand new book this year about wasps uh, in gardens and host plants for these. And it's again, it's sort of looking at this through the lens of what supports the insect rather than saying, here's a plant uh, and it supports some pollinator, but I don't know exa exactly what. Um, Xerxes Society also has good uh, um, uh, resources, as does this wonderful book here by uh, my good friend Kim Ironman, uh, The Pollinator Victory Garden. Um, all, the, all of these are really wonderful titles that you can't go wrong with. So with that, I will turn it over to Emily.
Thank you. Thank you so much, Uli. <clears throat> and um, just to note, Tamara, if you just monitor the chat now, that would be great. Um, so I'm gonna run through some species to avoid in your garden. Um, a lot of these are really common throughout the Adirondacks, as I mentioned, um, and I'm not gonna get too deep or down in the weeds about you know leaf shape and identification because I'm gonna share out all of these slides with you afterwards, as well as other tip sheets and connect you to our website where you can explore a lot of different species profiles for the plants I'm going to talk about. So if you live, like I live in Saranac Lake, if you live in the Adirondacks, I bet you a dollar you have invasive honeysuckle growing in your backyard. I'm seeing a lot of nodding already. Um, this is a group of um, maybe four different species, I believe. Um, three are shrubs and one is a vining, um, a vining variety. They grow incredibly densely. They have this, you know, shaggy bark and multi-stemmed approach unless they're growing as a vine. Um, and they have the ability to monopolize and dominate and create a monoculture in our forest floors. So a lot of those smaller herbaceous plants that Louis just lovingly profiled um, get shaded out by these, uh, by honeysuckle. They leaf out really early in the season. And so a lot of our spring ephemerals aren't getting the light they need. They're not getting the warmth they need from the sun. Um, and then eventually once it's, you know, dominating, creating a monoculture like this, um, this side has actually been treated with herbicide and this side has yet to be treated. Um, you know, there's no, there's no longer any space for plants to be growing. Um, a lot of plants are still in the soil seed bank or, you know, they're dormant and waiting for the day where some a natural resource practitioner you know puts in the time the money and unfortunately the chemical to remove these plants um, and we can see a lot of natives bounce back once we remove a monoculture but um, if we're able to just start removing them from our backyards we can do our part to prevent a situation like this um, honeysuckle i'll get to it is um a plant that is uh we have a lot of challenges with plants particularly, and they tend to be shrubs that are dispersed via birds, right? I don't control the birds. You don't control the birds. The birds are in charge of themselves and the birds will eat what they want. Um, and so when birds are eating a lot of berries throughout the, the landscape and are migrating, they're also bringing different plants with them. Unfortunately, honeysuckle berries, though attractive to a lot of different bird species, do not have the fats, the proteins, and the nutrients birds actually require in order to have and to carry out uh, a successful migration, which is extremely energy intensive. Um, so although the birds are, it's kind of like eating McDonald's. They're having a great time in the moment, but it's absolutely not beneficial to the birds. Um, hold on just one second. Um, another unfortunate, other than blocking out and shift, blocking out and shifting different plant communities in the in in a woodland, um, not being nutrition uh, efficient for different wildlife, honeysuckles are also associated with so this monoculture impact or this monoculture effect um, is also associated with larger tick numbers um, that have been recorded by researchers. So the shading that honeysuckles do, um, it's actually also shading, it's shading other plant life, but it's shading out the soil. So soil stays, you know, there's a lot of um, habitat created and safety for say small rodents to come in, which are carrying ticks. But it's also creating a more humid soil condition, which a lot of arachnids prefer. And ticks happen to be arachnids, which people don't realize. Um, and so a lot of research has gone into this. Um, and a couple other species that I'm gonna talk about for these escaped horticultural plants also are associated with this shading and monopolizing effect in woodlands, which also leads to more tick numbers. So there is a native honeysuckle. Um, and it looks extremely similar to the invasive honeysuckle. The four different species I talked about, except for the vine, also look extremely similar to each other. And so one of the identifying characteristics for honeysuckle, this is literally a, cle a, 
a clean cut, right? Um, not often, I, I've never seen this hollow effect be so clean and exact out in the world, especially in my backyard. But one of the key identifying factors for invasive versus native honeysuckle is if you were to crack a branch, um, they have really soft wood and it won't hurt the plant necessarily if you crack a little piece of the stem, but a native honeysuckle will actually have a solid white pith and the invasive honeysuckle will have a hollow brownish pith. Um, this is not always as big of a, of a diameter as you see here. It's often really, really tiny, um, but the photos you find on the internet are supposed to be idealized, right? So if you have honeysuckle, please dig it out. It's actually not that challenging to remove um, if you dig it out with hand tools. Um, vines are always a bigger challenge. Um, there's always gonna be a chunk of vine remaining in the soil that can then start rooting and regrowing. And so depending on the size of your honeysuckle infestation, um, it will most likely require revisiting it year after year um, in order to get smaller and smaller plants. And it's a long-term, you know, it's a long-term action plan. If you have a situation more like this woodland, um, I'm gonna promote you to come, I'm gonna plug for you to come to our workshop that'll be later in August about, you know, more management and DIY techniques. Another plan I'm gonna talk about, if you have been in Keene or Jay or Keene Valley or along Route 9 in the Adirondacks, you're probably familiar with seeing this plant out and about. Um, it's a huge growing cup plant, is a massively growing um, herbaceous perennial. It's in the aster family, so it's related to sunflowers. Um, and it is a native plant. Um, so that biogeographic context that I talked about really matters. And the way that we perceive of different plants over time also really matters. So, 10 years ago, you know, we were promoting use of a lot of uh, North American prairie plants um, to use in different types of gardens. Um, but there's a big difference between say, here's me with my plant cutting that I got from my friend, um, Uli, about 10 years ago. Um, so there's a big difference between planting a cup plant, say in a dense urban area surrounded by concrete we are supporting pollinators. Uh, we are supporting, you know, birds that need water. So cup plant uh, is called cup plant because these very, very large leaves actually fuse at the stem to create a little cup that can hold water. So in the prairie, this is amazing because it's really dry. Um, and that's actually not the really big challenge. The big challenge is that you know, we might be growing it down in Brooklyn where it might not be able to escape, but if we're planting it, say in the suburbs or rural areas, um, it's such a fast growing herbaceous perennial that um, it does easily, you know, escape the garden. Um, and we are finding that it can handle, in terms of being a generalist, it can be growing in awful dry urban soils, but it can also tolerate really wet soils. So in some definitions, it's considered a facultative wetland plant, and we're seeing it in dominate riparian areas. So along the Osceola River, this is a big challenge. It can promote erosion of a riparian zone where regularly we would have uh, willows with really uh, fibrous roots holding that bank together. We might have spirea holding that bank together. We might have different grasses and sedges and rushes holding that bank together. But when we have an herbaceous perennial that dies back in the fall and isn't there in the winter and isn't there in the spring when our water flows are the highest, that's where we can have a lot of stream bank loss, which has a cascade of aquatic habitat impacts, but also very real real estate impacts. It could be unsafe for roads or different types of infrastructure. So when we see fast growing herbaceous perennials like this, on stream banks or even knotweed is another plant that we're really focused on in riparian zones. Um, it has, we have ecological concern. Um, speaking of plants that do well in dense urban areas surrounded by concrete, another plant that we would really like folks to pay attention to, it's another plant that about 10 years ago or maybe more like 15 years ago at this point, um, 
was realized to be an amazing street tree. So Uli mentioned calorie pear and the proliferation of calorie pear. Um, back in the 80s, it was planted as a really popular street tree. But today, people's allergies are literally out of control because of this plant. So there's a huge health impact. Um, so Japanese tree lilac can tolerate really, really poor drought, um, dry soil. It's really disease resistant. And it was planted as urban street trees, but it was also planted in suburban areas. So in suburban areas, we start to lose that urban interface. Um, it's kind of that middle zone, right? There's no concrete holding it in. And so in the capital district, it was also planted heavily as a street tree. And we're starting to see uh, Japanese tree lilac enter into that riparian zone and start to naturalize. So if you also look around the Adirondacks, you realize what sort of horticultural plant really does well in our cold climate? Lilacs. This is why Russians love lilacs. It's very cold tolerant. Um, and so we're seeing these Japanese tree lilacs start to naturalize and have similar impacts for riparian habitat. Um, but also they grow, um, they, they can spread really well through different types of suckers that they shoot out. So if you have a lilac, you've probably also seen this happen in your own backyard. Um, so we would love for people to pay more attention to this plant. It's a typically a, a you know pruned into this tree-like shape, but if you see it out on the landscape, it's going to be a multi-branch shrub. And a really distinguishing factor of tree lilac is that the panicles of flowers are quite large and a lot looser than your typical lilac shrub. They're white in color and they're gonna hold on to their seed pods in the fall and through the winter. So you're gonna, they have really typical lilac leaves. Um, there's so many different types of trees in our area that have these lenticels and like almost like cherry tree bark that I'm gonna say avoid trying to ID through bark. But really these seed pods that the lilacs hold on to over the winter are what you're gonna, you're gonna identify. Um, and if you, if you see a tree lac, lilac, if you see something, say something. So I'm gonna send out some resources about IMAP invasives for you to help report this plant if you see it out on the landscape. It is not yet observed in our prism, which is great. But another plant that is commonly seen in our prism is winged burning bush or a type of uh, euonymus. So this is in every CVS parking lot. This is in every bank parking lot. This is also probably in your backyard. Um, Uli and I were just talking about how we never really saw this plant down in the city, but once he moved to Massachusetts and I moved up here, this plant is everywhere. Um, it also dominates forest, um, uh, low, the you know forest floor and different woodlands. So it breaks down diversity, it breaks down food webs, it breaks down different light conditions and soil conditions for adjacent plants and cascades of wildlife. It's really distinguished in the fall with this color. That's why it's planted. Um, but how you can ID it, you know, the rest of the year are these really distinctive wings on the sides of the on the sides of the stem. Um, Theoretically, they are still selling uh, sterile cultivars of this plant, but it's also not going to support any of the amazing wildlife and, you know, myriad of organisms that Uli just went through. So we have some tip sheets that I'm going to be sharing out about what plants you can be planting in your garden. You know, why not have this be a rhododendron? That's so much better. Why not be an azalea? That's so much better. Um, and you can remove this also with hand tools and digging and repeat treatments um, and just chip it up. Japanese barberry is also in every bank parking lot, in every CVS parking lot. It is the worst plant. Um, it is deer, so people like it because it's deer resistant, right? Deer resistant, it literally is. No plant you want to be deer resistant is actually deer resistant, but Japanese barberry is. Um, actually, so is euonymus. So not only are these plants outgrowing and outcompeting native counterparts, they're also not being selected by any grazers. So Japanese barberry can uh, grow really rapidly. It can tolerate shade. It can tolerate sun. 
It's bird dispersed through these berries that are also not nutritious. Um, and then as an added effect, deer do not eat it. Um, it also creates, you know, that under, that under story habitat for increased tick life. So ticks are not just carried by deer, they're also very much carried by mice. And so when we homogenize an ecosystem like in the suburbs or, you know, that wildland um, urban interface or suburban interface and we find, you know, there isn't structure diversity, there isn't species diversity, we're finding that the, that is also what really, you know, cultivates tick activity. And so that is, a as we all know on this call, that is a massive health challenge in the Northeast. So get rid of that Japanese barberry, dig it out, replace it. I'm gonna send you tip sheets of what to replace it with. And our last topic today, and this has a lot to do with plant sales. It has a lot to do with nurseries. It has a lot to do with compost, it has a lot to do with walking in the woods and you know, avoiding ecological devastation. Um, and we have a whole big workshop on this where I have it recorded and I'm gonna send out um, links to that recording from last August where we worked with Cornell Cooperative Extension in Dutchess County about invasive jumping worms. Um, invasive jumping worms have more common names than like mountain lions. So pumas, as I say, they have about 90 different common names. So um, invasive jumping worms might be called crazy worms or snake worms or Alabama jumpers or Asian jumping worms. Um, I just call them invasive jumping worms. And it's actually three different species. Uh, they've been in North America since about 1900, and they were also brought in through the horticultural trade. They're most likely in soil of different plants getting traded from around the world. Um, they also have a history of being sold as an angling bait um, because they thrash in their movement. That's one of their most identifying characteristics. And they can live underwater for 20 minutes. So ideally, you know, people are promoting it as a fishing worm. They're also brought um, and promoted throughout uh, kind of America's agricultural revol revolution throughout you know, industrialization um, in the 40s, 50s, 60s in Alabama to break up compaction and really clay soils. And then since the 80s to today, they've been sold as a excellent composting worm or an in vermiculture systems. Um, and they're still active, you, you can readily buy invasive jumping worms as a composting worm today, um, though it is absolutely not something you should purchase and use in your vermiculture system. If you have questions about worm composting, I can help answer those as well. Um, they are voracious eaters. And as I said, they have a distinctive thrashing movement. So you can look it up on YouTube and watch these horrifying videos of these worms wriggling and moving. Um, they live in large groups, unlike your typical European earthworm. Um, and they're an annual species, but their cocoons can live over the winter um, in the soil. Their cocoons are really, really hard to see. They look like little tiny lemons. Um, and so those can travel in your plants, in your pots, in your compost, on your shoes, on your pets. Um, and they have, uh, been devastating soils wherever they're found. Another identifying characteristic is that their clitellum is this bright contrasting white color to the rest of their body. Their clitellum, that's where their um, reproductive organs are housed. All worms have a clitellum or earthworms have a clitellum. Your typical earthworm has a little bump where that clitellum is found and the color is not gonna be so contrasting. Um, and again, I'll send you out this uh, webinar recording so you can learn all about different identifying characteristics. So that's a picture of the cocoon. And um, an indicator that you have these worms present is that your soil structure will change. So you might see them living, they live in the, the they're epigeic worms. So they live in the organic layer of your soil. They're gonna live in your leaf litter. The first thing you might notice is that your leaf litter is gone. There used to be leaf litter and there is no longer. Um, it's because they ate it really, really quickly as a group. Um, and when they're done with the leaf litter, they move down into the soil and your soil becomes sort of like a 
uniform coffee ground consistency, or also it's like um, like hamburger meat. Um, and so these are all their worm castings. They're done with organic matter and they've moved down into the soil. Um, and they, their eating activity is creates a multifaceted cascade of ecological problems from switching up, from changing uh, your carbon content, from changing your cover, so you're losing habitat for organisms. Get into that here. Um, as diverse as your plant life is in the world, your soil life, your soil food web is uh, exponentially more diverse. Um, you need a lot of structure. You need a lot of different characteristics to have healthy soil. And it's going, your leaf litter is gonna become a habitat for really small animals and insects and bacteria and fungi. Um, you're also going to be housing and protecting your spring ephemerals, which have really, really picky seeds that need to germinate and grow very, very slowly. Um, so the jumping worms, they'll remove all of that protective leaf layer. Um, and then they'll start to eat the soil. So um, you'll have increased nitrogenous uh, content in your soil, um, which can lead to eutrophication, but it can also shift what seeds are even able to germinate. You can have the pH of the soil change. You can lose all soil structure, which also limits oxygen content, water holding capacity, increases uh, erosion potential. Um, and those worms will also start to eat the roots of your plants. So in a garden, this is really devastating for your rhizomatic plants, for your tubers, and also your root hairs. So your plant life will start to suffer. There are really limited controls for invasive jumping worms. Um, it's recommended to inventory if you have them present. I will connect you to um, live maps where people are, you know, identifying where worms are present in New York State. Um, so there is a, actually a mustard seed pour or like a, you basically just mix mustard powder with water and you can do a drench on your soil. It won't hurt your plants. It won't hurt your soil. It will hurt worms. That's okay. All the worms are gonna come up out of the soil and come to the top. So you can actually kind of inventory. You can collect them in a plate or a bucket um, and you can inventory with some identification uh, what is there. So you might have different types of earthworms that are non-problematic. You might have invasive jumping worms, which you really wanna know about. And if you have jumping worms, this gets to that live map I will connect you to. You can report it on New York IMAP invasives. And if you do have jumping worms present, do not move soil or plants off your property. With small populations, you can hand pick them and destroy them. They are really, really um, temperature sensitive. All worms are. Um, so that's the adult or the eggs. And so if you have these worms present, if you've taken them out of your little inventory, you can bag them, solarize them. So in a trash bag, you can leave that trash bag out in the sun and they will die. And um, then you can throw it into the regular trash stream. But also if you have um, it in your soil, the cocoons are also really sensitive. So in the late summer, early fall in, um, in the Adirondacks, you're gonna have you know, your adults are gonna, might be dying back already, but they've already laid their eggs. So how do you take care of your eggs? Um, you can put down transparent, um, thick plastic directly onto your soil for a number of weeks until that soil temperature exceeds 104 degrees for a number of days. Um, and say if you have jumping worms or suspect that you have jumping worms or jumping worm cocoons, you can also, instead of putting plastic down on the soil, say if you have a compost pile or potted plants, you can take that soil and put it into a trash bag and leave it out in your driveway in the sun for a number of days, making sure it reaches at least 104 degrees for a number of days. Um, keep observing, right? The first time you did the solarization process, it might not have worked exactly the way you wanted it to. So keep observing, be observant. Um, keep digging. Um, they should be at the top part of your soil because they're epigeic. Um, 
And again, I'm gonna send you this much, much longer, more detailed uh, webinar about how to maintain and identify if you have invasive jumping worms on your property. So please do watch it, especially if you're in the Hudson Valley, especially. Um, the University of Wisconsin, you know, research on this is so limited, but some people are saying that you can also cultivate in really abrasive materials into your soil, and that can start to cut up and start to kill adult worms after you've solarized. So it might be, you know, biochar, diatomaceous earth, um, shells or husks, um, you know, green sand isn't really, you know, sold anymore, but um, adding that abrasive material, being observant, paying attention, solarizing if necessary. And if you have this in your area, push for, um, you know, as Uli said, ask questions for your nursery, um, trust, uh, buy from trusted resources, especially if it's compost or soil being delivered, go to that place and dig around and see for yourself. Um, and push your local plant swaps to adopt bare root practices or also go forth and have seed exchanges. Um, there's no soil in seeds. So again, prevention is the best method. Don't use it. If you're fishing, don't use it. Use certified bait only. Um, clean boots and gear before you're hiking um, in case you're gonna pick it up out on the trail or you don't wanna bring it out to the trail. Um, trust your source for soil and compost. Absolutely under no circumstances purchase this as a vermicomposting worm. If you're gonna do vermicomposting, use your red wiggler worms and you know, reach out to me and I'll answer some of your questions. And you know, ask your nursery, bug them, right? You're the customer, um, but also push your community groups if you're involved in like master, uh, master gardener programs to do bare root exchanges, or seed exchanges. And then I'll connect you to IMAP Invasives. Um, that's that live mapping tool. So you can also find out where jumping worms have been observed throughout New York State if you're concerned in your area. We have an, we are really running close and have, um, we'll see if there's time for questions. Uh, we threw a lot of information at you today and I really appreciate everybody hanging on. Um, I have so much stuff I'm going to give you. So I mentioned a number of different recorded webinars that we've already done um, that will give you more detail on some of these topics, but you'll also get a recording of this webinar as well as PDFs of our slides so that you can review. We give you a lot of info. I'm also working to develop a nursery list um, so that you can go out and buy some of these species that we talked about. Um, Believe it or not, it, it's, I've been asking really smart people and there's not a lot of info out there. Um, I'm gonna connect you to the, the Native Plant Trust has a really awesome online mapping tool and all these little selection buttons um, for their garden plant finder. So I want a shrub in a shady area in Adirondacks uh, that attracts this pollinator. And it will, you know, through a lot of algorithms and tags that like, can generate what species you need. The challenge is where do you buy it, right? So I'm developing that, that resource list for you. I'm also gonna share out a lot of different native plant trusts, um, uh, detailed plant lists for different types of spaces and uses. So low growing native ground cover, um, shady gardens, tough gardens, right? So if it's really, really wet or really, really rocky, huh, like the Adirondacks. Um, Lots of different tip sheets for you there. I'm gonna connect you to IMAP invasives, especially to go out and find that Japanese tree lilac or to know before you go and see if there's invasive jumping worm issues in your area you just haven't observed before. Um, the New York State DEC also has a brand new aquatic uh, plant guide. So I know that I myself once went down a big wormhole when I got into having a backyard pond and what plants I should have and what plants I should not have. I also shouldn't have a pond. It, it costs a lot of money and I spiral out of control. Um, but what plants should you use and what plants you, should you absolutely not use because freshwater plants very readily get out into the ecosystem. And we here in the Adirondacks have over 3000 lakes and ponds we would love to keep free of um, a lot of different invasive plants. Um, one really awesome, 
a resource. So a lot of you have probably heard of the Adirondack Pollinator Project from ADK Action. They're having a lot of really fun native plant, native gardening happy hours occur throughout the spring. And I've put those on our events page. So I'd love for you to go join those. They're gonna be really fun and they're gonna talk about garden design. They're gonna talk about plant availability. They're gonna talk about you know, seed collection. So join in on those. Um, ADK Action and the Adirondack Pollinator Project are really, really great. And they're trying to make more locally sourced native plants available to you. And then we're working to solidify our summer schedule, um, but we are gonna have a more DIY, how to manage your property uh, workshop coming up this early August. So how do I get rid of these plants? Well, here's how. Um, so I can stay on. I know Uli is a busy, busy man um, to answer some of your questions. Um, I think I was able to answer a number of these throughout the talk. So did we have any other questions, Tamara? while I was going on and on? No, I think you answered most of them. Someone was wondering if they could share plants, um, thinking about invasive jumping worms. And I think you gave some great resources. Check first, make sure that you don't have the worms. Also, bare root and seeds are good. Someone also wants to know if the nursery list you're providing would actually be good in the crisp area. I think we're mostly focusing on the Adirondacks and Catskills, right, or Adirondacks and um, Capital Region right now. There actually are, uh, I think, like three uh, niche nurseries in the Catskills um, and around the, the Capital District. And so a lot of those higher altitude plants that we mentioned um, were also in that same ecoregion. So I think a lot of this information is applicable. Lee, you are a Catskill expert, so I'll let you take it away. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, there's there's a couple of nurseries in the Catskills, Catskill natives for one, um, to mind. Um, but most of what most of what you would be able to source at a native plant nursery in the Northeast would be appropriate for either the Capital Region or the Adirondacks or um, Western Massachusetts or you know uh, northern further into New England. So. Um, you know, the, the one thing, again, I would say is, is if you're looking for a specific plant, um, just do a little research so you can figure out where does it naturally grow and whether that coincides with where you live. Uli, a couple of questions for you about um, particularly native seed banks and um, and planting natives to replace invasives. There may not be any simple answer, but you know, if you've taken out your invasives, how long do you wait before you put in a native? And is there any sort of time frame for the native seed banks to recover after you've pulled out the invasives? Um, I tend to recommend that people plant immediately afterwards. Uh, so that there is some competition if there's any root fragments or other things that are that um, are pulled in you know in the, in the soil seed bank that are pulled to the surface in the action of you removing your invasive if you just leave it bare something will grow there um, and more often than not it will won't be what you want um, and so I tend to recommend that if you are going to do any kind of larger scale removals, make sure that you have your desired plants ready on hand and that you plant right away uh, and get them established. Um, so there's no need to necessarily um, wait in between removal and, and replanting. Uh, it really all depends on your capacity to get the new stuff in the ground. I would, I would agree with that. And I would say that um, that scale really changes. Say if you're dealing with a backyard garden or even a one acre garden versus uh, landscape management in 150 acres, in 800 acres, in many thousands of acres. So when someone's dealing with huge spaces, um, you're gonna try, you're gonna try to be cost cost efficient and see if anything comes back and see what the second challenge is. And then maybe go with seed rather than, you know, actual potted plants because the cost is that much greater. Um, 
We had another question here too that said, um, I live in a townhome in the suburbs. Is it worth planting a mini native garden if none of my neighbors have any? And I'd say that it's the most important for you to plant a native plant garden um, to be that sort of, it's, you know, you would be an island of food as a lot of uh, species either migrate or hatch or move about. Um, and you would be, you'd be like the only diner around basically. So I think that's absolutely pertinent for you to, yeah. for you to garden if nobody else is. I would chime in and say, be courageous and do it. Um, one of the other um, hurdles sometimes people face, uh, particularly in suburban settings, um, is they don't want to have their yard look different than everybody else's. And in fact, I think it, it does take an act of courage to embrace a different aesthetic and not keep everything looking tidy and clean and you know meatballed and 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 string trimmed uh, into into submission like everybody else does you don't have to be like your neighbors uh, i'll give an example my father-in-law is in chicago and works at volunteers with native seed collection for prairie plants and his front yard is about six foot by six foot with 12 foot prairie plants growing in it. So that's where that cup plant should be is out in Chicago, but yeah. maybe not on the Osceola River. So he's definitely being yeah. different. And someone did say to check with your HOA first or do it and ask for permission later. Well, um, and I would say also, if, if you do get any kind of pushback from homeowners associations, it's an opportunity to, to have a conversation about those regulations and how maybe they need to shift and be a little bit more relaxed um, about what is acceptable. Um, many of these rules have been in place for decades and were written by people who, who um, thought that that particular aesthetic was what your neighborhood should look like. Um, and so it's never too early to uh, challenge that a little bit and, and present good sound arguments about why um, you ought to be able to um, plant something different than everybody else. I'd also push that uh, the Native Plant Trust has really excellent resources for, uh, you know, replacing lawns and making ecological spaces of what was once a lawn. But also, they have a vast amount of classes and courses and workshops for you to take what you've learned here and, you know, expand your design skills, expand your gardening skills. Um, and so really do explore the Native Plant Trust uh, website. It's really extensive. Yep. Thank you for that, Emily. We, we have, I think, over 200 courses offered right now. All of them are online um, and a wide range of topics. So I'm sure there's, there's something for, for everybody to, to you know, um, dive into. So. And I got one more question on how to prepare bare root plants without killing them. I will add a tip sheet on that. It's a multi-step process, but it's not too scary. Um, well, I wanna thank uh, all of you for being here today and for loving gardening. It's the best thing you can do with your life. And I wanna thank Uli for joining us. Um, it's always a pleasure to have you and to share your love and knowledge. It really comes through. And he took all those photos and I'm really jealous of the macro lens. Um, so thank you everyone. Uh, you'll be hearing from me and I hope you all have a wonderful day. You all have my email, so feel free. It's my job to answer your questions. So feel free to ask me questions. Thank you. All right, thank you everybody. Uli, was that hawk the hawk from the dump? Oh, he might have left already. I'll have to ask him offline. Well, thank you, everybody, so much. Have a wonderful day. Get outside. Thank you.